Hello, everybody. My name is Yanis. And a short intro before I start going into what's the future of authentication, so or experience. Uh, before starting uh, working in uh, Synoptiki, we developed two-factor authentication, which was SMS-based for Latvian mobile telephone. And at that time, like we saw that there are like uh, some security flaws, like also like Google has pointed out that there are like some easy ways how you can use SMS for uh, getting into another account. And I will go into deeper that in my presentation a little bit further. But afterwards, the cool thing which we created and which was super secure are electronic ID cards. So they are usually uh, issued by the government and that's where we uh, worked before for the Latvian government developing the architecture of electronic ID cards. So the thing what you can do with them, you can use it for authentication as well as for signing legal contracts. The downside is that with these cards you also need to have a reader. And the problem always has been that only 10% of the citizens has uh, decided that they want these cards, and out of that 10% decided that they want actually to use that. So basically, out of population, 1% is only using this kind of solution, even though it's very safe and gives a lot of benefits. So the question is, what is next in the field of authentication? Last year, in April, we got invited by the Commercial Bank Association to consult them how banks can meet the PSD2 requirements for strong two-factor authentication. So, what that means for the account information service providers uh, who are using uh, APIs to show data in one place, basically not a lot of things will change. Most likely, they will use just tokens where they do the authentication based on that. But where it changes, it is for the payment initiation services. Instead of one factor, uh, like a password, uh, you would use two factors. And what, what means two-factor authentication? Basically, all right. basically, you can, you can sum that in these three things. Something what can be easily guessed, so that's at the moment our passwords. Something what can be left in cabs, so these are the hardware tokens which our banks use currently for authentication. Or something what can be chopped off, like a, like a finger for the fingerprint. So the PSD2 says that you have to use two of these factors, you can decide which ones. So let's go into challenges which uh, we see with PSD2. So the first one is security. The hardware tokens, which currently a lot of banks use, so they are very secure, but the problem always has been how to do that on a large scale. If you have to roll it out in 2018 to a lot of customers, so it could be very complicated and very expensive as well, even though it's like quite a safe uh, solution. The problem with the software solutions which we have seen so far is that most of them use shared secrets. There was an Intel report in 2014 where they used a malware app to get the key from a Kronto sign and then they used it to another phone to replicate the user and they were successful with that. So that's why we believe that like shared secret um, software solutions are not a way forward. About the SMS, uh, the thing what we have seen lately from the discussion papers, which are out by the uh, European Banking Authority, uh, they have put in that for the multi-purpose devices like the mobile phones, there should be a trusted execution environment. Uh, for SMS, well, it's not exactly how it works. So most likely is that they will not do uh, what the technical standards will be uh, handed out by the end of this year. So, what is actually the trusted execution environment? We have seen by, um, for instance, like Danish Banking Association, who says that this is the future. And the way how it actually works is that there's a separate hardware element on the phones which you can use to generate and store private keys. And 
you don't need to use any like SIM card based solution. It's also not like a shared secret solution. You can use uh, public key infrastructure where you protect the uh, key by the phone's hardware. And it seems also that the regulators are also in the opinion that this is the right way forward. So interesting thing is that currently from all the phones which people own, like nine of the 10 already have this chip installed. For the iPhones, it's called Secure Enclave, which they use for Apple Pay. For the Android phones, it's called uh, Trusted Execution Environment, where you can create this hardware level um, security. So the question is, what about the SIM cards? So a lot of companies, like especially like telecommunication companies, they have been using SIM cards uh, for providing security to the banks. And not only authentication, but even like signing, uh, where they give the special cards out, which are uh, not like typical ones, a little bit more expensive. The problem with that is that by the 2017, Apple and Samsung, they have been in talks that there will be like seamless phones. So for instance, in Estonia, the whole identity uh, solution is built upon on the SIM cards. So the question is like, what happens when you cannot put the SIM card anymore? Do you uh, certify for the uh, Apple's or Samsung pre-installed SIM card or how do you do that? So this is like a pretty big challenge with using SIM card solutions. That was in a nutshell about uh, what we think about security and where we see the biggest concerns at the moment. So the next challenge which uh, I want to talk about is about convenience and scalability. So basically this sentence pretty much sums everything up. That the more, system, the, the more complex the system becomes, the less secure it is. I was meeting with one of the banks who were saying that for employee authentication, they are using these smart cards. But the problem is that they are so inconvenient that they are basically cutting out the chips in order to use them, or like their kids are using the card readers as transformers. So you, you, yeah, you, don't want to, you don't want to house that. And each time it's like separate onboarding again and again. And if you are doing it several times, that at one moment there could be some human elements that you just give it to not the right person. The way forward from the convenience point of view is, in our opinion, mobile phone. Because right now the mobile phones are more powerful actually what they use for the computation when they launch the Apollo mission. And the one of the most convenient solutions which we have seen is that you use like simple push notifications. It could be completely without push notifications where you just like authenticate, but then you also want to be sure that there's like element of people's will that they actually says, yes, I want to authenticate that. So that's why you have to have some kind of element, some kind of thing what can regulate who is doing what. And the good thing is that you can also add well, for the mobile phone to the top of the layers many other solutions like fingerprint, uh, face recognition, voice recognition. Uh, so these all things can be implemented one solution from the mobile phone. Now as, as I was telling before, this separate trusted execution environment gives a high level security for that. Interesting things what we have seen, um, there are solutions which are for instance using special gadgets which you attach to your smartwatch which either read your vein patterns or your heart rate. The challenges we have seen there is that they are at the moment 85% precise and that it's also quite expensive. So imagine if you want to roll it out to like millions of customers, then this might not be the best solution to do that if you do it on a cost-effective basis. One more solution, which is interesting, what we have seen is, is palm scanners. Uh, so these as well could be something what could be used in the future, but at this moment still not very precise and very expensive as well. Another interesting thing uh, which we have seen are behavior patterns. 
So these things uh, we see that they are a great complement to the existing authentication system. Like for instance, they are measuring how you are typing, how fast, uh, how hard are you pushing the keyboard. We were trying to personate persons, uh, just like looking how one person is typing and then trying to replicate that. And it's actually at the moment quite easy to do that. So in the future, it could be more advanced using uh, data algorithms, but at the moment, still not there. And another thing what I wanted to mention here is about the voice and sounds. And not in a way that they just authenticate your voice, but that they look at the surroundings around you and use that sound for authentication. But as well, at the moment, not very precise, but in the future, it could be uh, actually a big deal. So why like the convenience is such an important point? It's because the more convenient the authentication is, the more touch points and the highest adaptation rate for your customers it is. So basically, through authentication, you can be sure that customers will more likely use your digital banking instead of somebody else. And now to my most uh, pleasing point, which is about interoperability. So about that all these solutions, they have to work together because there's not only PSD2, but there are some other regulations. And uh, I want to use the next slides to say how it all works together. Have you heard about the AIDAS? So, yes, all right, so there are some people. This year in July, the AIDAS came, to, came into effect, and what that means actually, AIDAS is about digital signatures and authentication. So, that all the digital signatures which is made in one member state, they are legally binding in all the member states. So, that's one part. And the other part is that for the first time also, for the qualified electronic signatures, which are used to sign like uh, loans, which was also Paul mentioning about the, in the morning, that's quite important topic, or establishing companies, you can use mobile phone instead of special uh, signature creation device. In uh, Denmark, a similar solution based on the um, TAN list has been 87% popular among the citizens. So they are using one solution for authentication in banks as well as for signing legal contracts. The next generation authentication, which they will have next year, will be totally mobile. So they are also moving in this direction that they believe that it has to work together uh, between many services, not only banking, but also signing contracts with public bodies or the third parties. And the most common infrastructure, what everybody is using that in the government services is a public key cryptography. So you use two keys, <coughs> where one is usually on the uh, device itself, and one is on the uh, side of the company. And then you can authenticate in a very safe manner. And this also allows to sign the contracts. So what are the biggest challenges at the moment for having these qualified electronic signatures? So in order to get the qualified electronic signatures, there are certain procedures which you need to follow. At the moment, in most of the countries, it is that you have to be uh, your identity has to be checked face to face. So basically, you have to go to a special place. They check that you are you, showing your passport, and then they give you, for instance, a smart card with a reader, which you can use for authentication and for signing legal contracts. Interestingly, is that in Germany, uh, the Ministry of Finance has stated that. Uh, on-premises, onboarding, is translated to video onboarding. So basically, in, if, if you do video onboarding, then you can have uh, substitute, you can substitute the need for being present in the spot. And another thing, in order to move to completely like mobile solutions, where you use mobile phone for digital signatures, is that there's still not a list of the trusted uh, 
uh, uh, signature creation devices. So what we announced that by this end of this year, beginning of next year, the each member state of the European Union, they will put the list of devices which are approved, like mobile phones which are approved to carry these qualified electron signatures, and then it will be rolled out across the whole uh, European Union. Another regulation where I see that PSD2 works pretty well together. So the PSD2 is about old open banking, uh, but there's another one called data privacy regulation, which is about that the user can ask the bank to share his information with the fourth party, or he can ask the bank to forget some information. The thing what we have seen is that a lot of banks are afraid that because of this regulation, it will be easier for their customers to move to another bank because they can just say, all right, share this information uh, about my credit history with another bank. So there's actually this element that it's not only about how you do this authentication and uh, providing the information to the third party in a very safe manner, but also how you as a bank protects some data, so it's not so easily that the user can share everything uh, with other parties. The way how it looks like, it would be basically something similar like this. Oh, it's very slow. That instead of registering in many services, user, for instance, is uh, registered at the bank. And then it can use this bank's pass, or it could be also like a telecommunication pass, to authenticate and share information with the third parties. So let me give you an example. So, for instance, you want to go to Italy. So usually what happens is that you go to an airline company and you need to register, fill all your information. Instead of that, you just provide your ID and let's say you log in with the uh, bank's pass, which is there. Let's say like that. And what happens next is that the bank um, contacts you and asks, oh, do you want to share this information with the uh, airline company? And then if you approve, then like information, like basic information could be shared uh, with the airline company or in some cases, if it's just to validate some information, are you living in this area, that they even will not give the information away. They just say, yes, this person is living there without sharing the information with somebody else. So why the bank should do that? Why, why banks should like look about this whole integrated think about that the PSD2 authentication and AIDAS and GDPR, it all is like a whole ecosystem instead of like separate silos. Because at the moment, like the customers trust banks. So they trust with the money the banks and uh, identity is just a next step how you can create more value uh, for, for, for the customers. And we believe that this together, like the banks together with telecommunication companies or other service providers could create a very nice uh, service instead of just like looking at authentication as a separate thing. So that's from my side uh, all. So if you have any questions, I would be happy to answer. We have time. One question here, second one, third one. Yeah, thank you very much for this presentation. This is Bruno Kambunay speaking. One, one quick question is about the sharing of identity or personal data. Um, is this uh, possible instead of sharing data, I mean the identity and all detailed personal information, to share only a token? I mean, is this something which is discussed uh, or uh, should a bank share directly the data? You know, the, your last slide is a bit... Um, uh, confusing to me. Mm -hmm. All right. You, <laughs> so there are like two things about the sharing data. So if it's just like that, you need to make sure that uh, first about some some information that the person 
is who he says he is or if he's like living in one place, then you can just like send a response back that you as a bank, you have checked their identity and you guarantee that this is right. So this could be done like very uh, easily. Uh, another part is that there are like some attributes which you would like to share with the third party, like let's say your uh, basic general information, uh, or the banks might decide they uh, might also be willing to share like their credit scoring risks about uh, some persons and they could like sell even this information to the third parties. So then it is uh, not like uh, so simple like token based, but there you have to have like some certificates where you share this particular information with the third party. Yes, uh, thank you for your presentation. Very interesting. Uh, my question is, oh, by the way, I'm Xiaodong from UAU. I live in the Netherlands. So as you can see, uh, in different countries, you have similar solutions. In the Nordic, we have Bank ID, which is yes. very successful. In Holland, we have a solution called IDIN, which e effectively nobody using it. <laughs> so why, what do you see the difference here? What do you see the challenges for this solution to rolling out? Mm -hmm. I think that the thing what the Nordic countries uh, has been doing quite well, like also like why Bank ID, for instance, is popular and the Estonian solution is quite popular, is that the government said it's obligatory. So they pushed all the uh, people living in the country that they have to have this kind of solution. Uh, the challenge which I see right now, like with the most of the solutions, is that as they have been built some time ago, and most of the solutions were based on the SIM cards, special SIM cards which you put into the mobile phones. So as was mentioning before in the beginning of the presentation, that's a big challenge if the phones will become like seamless, what to do then? So like the whole identity infrastructure needs to change something else or do we certify these chips uh, which are already in the phones uh, that they meet all these requirements to give out, the, for instance, these qualified electronic signatures, which are used for a lot of public institution services and for, for authentication in certain steps. One more question. Christopher Trojan in TIFF. Uh, you've mentioned the IDAS actually as uh, one of the sources of trust here uh, and let's say qualified certificates. Mm -hmm. But how would you comment on the fact that like in the latest regulatory technical standard that we've seen for PSD2. EIDAS was mentioned, for example, only in the context of uh, authentication of uh, third-party providers mm -hmm. in between each other. Yes. While, uh, and actually payment services provider. Yes. yes. While there is absolutely no mention how those kind of solutions uh, could be used for identifying uh, payment service users. Mm -hmm. And effectively, how do you think it will impact the fragmentation of markets? So uh, how do we prevent the situation where the bank will actually choose a method of strong customer authentication that would render some of the innovative solutions yeah. unusable? If I need to carry, I don't know, this beautiful token <laughs> around, and, and actually it needs, uh, I don't know, network connectivity, it mm -hmm. can prevent, I don't know, a, a service that basically I need to tap my phone somewhere mm -hmm. because I will not have a chance of doing it. Mm -hmm. So how does it work all together? As, as, what, yes. what do you think is the way out? Yeah, it's, like, it's a very interesting question. Uh, that when actually the European Banking Authority, when they first uh, published the first discussion paper, there was this question about should the authentication for the PSD2 be based on the AIDAS. So what we hear from the, all the answers, like everybody was saying, yeah, AIDAS is very strong authentication, but it's too heavy like for the banking. Uh, I think that's the challenge why everybody was trying to get away from that, is that it's it, it's still like uh, there are some things which haven't figured out with aid. So it's in effect starting from July, but like um, devices where, which can carry the qualified electronic signatures, for instance, they have not yet published. Um, as well as such a thing like digital onboarding as well. So that's the thing what is not sold in, in, in many, many countries. But I think that the bottom point is here, if, if you want to create like a solution which is like a future proof, which like in the future you can use as well, 
because the regulation at one point, like AIDIS, the all the standards, everything will be set up for like much easier digital onboarding for all the standards for the device also will be there. That you would want that your authentication is in compliance with that because then it opens the doors to many services, like for instance, that you can give out a loan or uh, give out a mortgage. Uh, in a very simple way that you digitally sign it from your, for instance, from your mobile phone instead of doing right now on premises where you sign it by the paper or using the electronic ID cards. So there are some advantages with the AEDES and I think that if you, if like the PSD2 is pushing the banks to adopt a new authentication system, so why not to include the standards of AEDES? Thank you, Janice. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir.